Amy, who's that guy that you brought with you and the boys today? <laughs> Keep showing up. <laughs> it's good to see you, Casey. Good to have you home. Casey's out protecting the the country from the from the fires and all of that. So it's good to have them. It's good to have everybody here today. What a good set. Good music today. I think for. Uh, yeah, the God is good all the time, isn't he? All the time. You know, I asked to be doing the announcements today because I thought that Stan was back from hunting. And uh, so I was going to do sing happy birthday to him. He's not even here. Ed, where are you at, man? you want to finish this up? And <laughs> oh, I had to ask permission from three people today if it was okay. <laughs> Sorry, huh? Humbling. Humbling, yeah, I know. I was hoping they'd say no, but they were too eager. Um, we don't have any bulletins for everybody today because the ones that we did have, some lady gave us a whole bunch of them, so we didn't buy any more. But then when we tried to use some that this lady gave us, we realized why she gave them to us and not the church that she's attending uh, because they just don't work for our deal. So anyways, I got one, but that was it. Really easy announcements. There's a women's Bible study at 1030 a.m. on Tuesdays. At 7, there's praise team practice. And at 6 to 730, there's kids club. Well, praise team will be without Sarah this week at 7 o'clock. I knew there was something I was forgetting to do. Uh, I, we're going to have either with the Friday or Saturday. Well, I'm busy uh, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, and Thursday night. Okay, yeah, Thursday night won't work for us. So what I want to do is just trust that you guys are adults and you can work it all out. And yeah, it'll, it'll work out just fine. Ten, ten, ten Commandment Boogie, man. I'm trying to get to do, to do the Ten Commandment Boogie. Wouldn't that be a fun song to do on Sunday morning? Yeah, see, I'm telling you. Maybe that's what I need to do. We're the kids, man. You guys need to go bug Miss Sarah. <clears throat> um, one other thing that's not on here that, you know, we have Sunday school at, uh, at 10 o'clock on Sunday mornings. And it's really good conversation, good easy stuff and uh but anyways right before that i don't know what at nine what time do you guys do 9 15 to 9 45 light clockwork they've been coming on sunday morning and praying so if any of you ladies or men or whatever would like to come and be a part of that love to have you um we do have some prayer requests obviously stan clinton and his beautiful bride martha we want you to keep them in our prayers. Vicki Childers, did I say her name, Childers? In, in our prayer, Mel and Larry, um, having a baby is, even in 2023, having a baby can be difficult. And so we need to keep keep Mel in our prayers for... She seems to be doing okay, but she's only getting it. Oh, yeah, but well, we won't stop until the little feller's out making... Larry's hair are gray or falling out or huh? <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. We want the Lucas Bicanley and the family. I mean, this has been uh, just been a long fight. And uh, you know, I don't know if we told you last week, but they they did put him in hospice after he's been fighting this since 16 to 23. That's a that's a lot. Of, that's a long time. And uh, I'm not sure how the family wants us to pray. We pray that the family can can see past this, I guess. Um, that they can spend this time with their son and just continue to love him. But I guess my, my prayer is, is if the Lord won't find fit to heal him, I pray that the Lord will have mercy on him and make these last time, um, you know, you know, and it's a hard prayer to pray for anybody. But uh, absolutely uh, keep the family 
in your prayers. Keep praying for Joel and I's friends, the, the Dan e, um, Eisman, or Eisman, is he lost his wife as we as we've shared with you all. And uh, but but anyways, keep, continue to pray for Riley and Tiffany and the boys, and Josh. And uh, any what's going on with Josh? Is his Yeah. Oh, okay. So right now they're just going to monitor it now for a little while and see if it gets worse or better. I do have other news, though. Okay. Well, we want to hear it. Well, I'm glad you're all sitting down. You're pregnant, aren't you? Oh, you're going to be a great-grandma? I'm going to be a great-grandma. Yeah, the baby's due in July. Yeah, and July. Cool. Yeah. Well, it's about time. It's really, it's really hard for her family. So her name is Tannis. Tannis. Tannis is her name. Tannis is spelled just like Tannis, only with an A. So okay. That's why we're uh, not wanting it to be so quick. It's too late now. It's too late now. Her parents are rebuking her, and so we're just being supportive and loving on them and doing what we can do. Yeah. You know what? Somebody asked me the other day, well, Dallas, how often do you talk to your mom? I said, you know, I talk to her about once every three months or whatever, you know, not, not much. We started talking about it, you know, I talk to my mother-in-law almost every day, about every three months with my mom. And, uh, but, the reality is, is when we first moved to Idaho, that woman wished me dead. They were not very pleased with us coming to Idaho. They weren't very pleased with the, like, 20 years of our marriage. I don't think they were very pleased. But like I said today, we talk almost every day. And so, there's hope. There's hope. And what's really good is when I talk to my mother-in-law, she's not reminded me of how inadequate I am anymore. But we were able to have conversations around the Lord. And what's God doing in her life? And what God's trying to do in my life if I just let him? So... There's hope. And you know what, Josiah? <laughs> I just just want to laugh. I, I always laugh when it happens to other people. <laughs> we weren't laughing if it was to happen to us. All right, today's message is going to be in, in Romans chapter 14. Uh, for praises, we're just praising God that we can be a part of his wonderful family. And Ephesians 2.19 says that, con consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. I don't know, I think, I think in today's world, we take that for granted. We take for granted how important it is to do what we're doing right now, to come together corporately. Um, yeah, I think a bunch of the real work is done at home. This is done out in the, in the trenches. But you know what? Coming together, there's, uh, there's something about that that uh, I know for me rejuvenates yet me. It, um, I don't know. It's just there's something about it. So I think that I'm very excited about the family that God has given Joellen and I as far as our church family. It's where we've been. We feel very very blessed. And we're definitely praising God for that. There's ministry opportunities. Carl uh, brought in a box with some uh, canned stuff, food and stuff for the Boise Rescue Mission. And so please let's keep that on. You know, we're getting into Turkey Day and Christmas. Now I think that, that these homeless folk and they're needing food every, every day of the year. But I mean, I really, you know, I guess that's what we do is we just, yeah, yeah, yeah. But on Turkey Day and Thanksgiving or in Christmas, you know, we need to make sure they got some food. So uh, if, uh, if you just bring your stuff, we'll make sure it gets to the right, to the right people. Fifth Sunday, today is the fifth, is that? Today, today's the fifth Sunday. 
And uh, so I hope that everybody had been praying over their envelope and, and turned in their fifth Sunday love offering. If not, we will take it next week too. Um, the, uh, the week after that, we might have to uh, send people out to your houses. Um, oh, just joking. Anyways, um, the, all this money is going to the American Foundation of Suicide Prevention, which we've talked a lot about, as most of you know. Um, November 4th is coming right around the corner, and uh, which um, so this is a, a very near and dear topic to I think most of us in San Hollow anymore. Um, but anyways, the donations money is sent directly to the to the American Foundation of Suicide Pre- Prevention to be used for programs that help individuals, families, and schools. And uh, I have, I, I'll say it one more time, I'm really happy to see the stats on where Idaho fits in the whole deal. You know, seven years ago, we were in the top five, and now we're in the top 14 or 15 or something like that. I mean, the numbers are, we're going in the right direction. And so uh, that'd be really cool one day, this side of heaven, in the state of Idaho, it would be zero. Wouldn't that be cool? Um, anyways, Boys of Rescue Mission already did that. Before I ask for any anniversaries or uh, and birthdays, which Stan's not here, well, I will. <laughs> well, at least he says, at least the best part of Stan comes. We have saying happy sympathy data to her. Um, but anyways, Joellen's going to come up and share a little bit. On Wednesday nights, Joellen and I have been attending a class that I've built up, tore down, built up, tore down. And, uh, but you know, we're, anyways, what we would really like to do is to take the pulse of our little church and to see if we can't get some of you people to come together to be a part of, well, I'll let Joellen tell you what it'll be. And so we've been doing, the, it's called Untying the Knots. And I kind of started the class for a different reason than Dallas did, because I had knots to untie. <laughs> and so, and he was basically kind of talked into joining it to, to, so that we could lead it out here one day. But, you know, really what the class is about um, is realizing who we are, remembering who we are. Because, you know, we, as Christians, you know, if we've been raised as Christians, we've been taught what the Bible says, that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. But somewhere along the lines, we lose that. We, we start believing what our family is telling us. Um, maybe, maybe our families are a little harsh with us, you know, and so we start believing some things that might not be true about us. We start believing what culture says about us, what society labels us as, and, and we start having to fight all these lies. And so we have a, we have a train that, you know, all these false thoughts, all these fixed, they, they become fixed thoughts. And so these fixed thoughts are pulling our train. And, and so we have all these lies that we're building our foundation on, we set our beliefs on. And so it's, it's just untangling that. You kind of think of, you know, a bunch of necklaces that are all tangled up. And, and it's hard to undo those by yourself. And so, you know, to untie the knots of our lives that have been created by family, by culture, by society, we, we need each other. It's just another, another thing to show how much we need each other in the family of God. And ultimately, we find out, we are reminded that we belong to a new family. We don't have to fight. We, we need to start gauging our beliefs on truth. You know, taking it back to the truth, you know, and relating the, the truth of God's word to the emotions that we deal with, to the thoughts that we think, and linking those all together so that we have a healthy, a healthy look as to who we are and reminded that we are fearfully and wonderfully made and start coming back to the truth of that. So we're, we're trying, we would like to do a class and stuff and we really want to... Um, I encourage you guys to pray about it, think about it, if this is something that you want to do. 
So, but I really enjoyed the class, and we just finished the first book. We're going to be doing book two in January, and so I'm really excited to see what that has to offer. Good. Thank you, honey. Even in Sunday school, it's a small group, but any small groups that we get together, you know, if, uh, if we allow the Lord through the Holy Spirit, I mean, I mean he can take, small groups are powerful. There's powerful. I mean, there's people who we went out and had dinner with before we started this group. I would not have went out and had dinner with. Okay? There's people before we started this group that, I'm not going to say they were an enemy, but definitely not a friend. Okay? Who are now I consider friends. Um, in fact, one of them just this week is, uh, um, he told me that he loved me. I mean, the first time that I met Brian, man, I wanted to punch him in the throat. There's just not a doubt about it, you know, to, to this relationship. And so, yeah, we're all in the same boat. We're all in the same boat. And I think the little Bible studies like this will show us that we're in the same boat. Little studies like this help me understand, okay, why do, why do we do some of the things we do? You know, why does the church do what the church does? Uh, anyways, one last thing I'll say about the class is that I am so thankful. Not really. But you know what I've noticed is that I'm so blessed. Now, you know, listen, people who've been raised up in the church... I think that you guys should come to this class, okay? Because there's hang-ups that, by being raised in the church that we've developed, okay? Where I wasn't raised in the church, I didn't have these hang-ups, you know? I don't have a lot of the, the stuff that we were hearing people go through because of being raised in a Christian home. And uh, there's a lot of unintentional hurt done, and confusion done in the Christian home. And I really can't even believe I'm up here saying this, you know, because the generations before us just were tougher, evidently. But uh, listen, if you've been raised in the church, really pray about this and give it and give it a thought. And even if you haven't been raised in the church, it might be something good because it really will take you to, but the end, of the end result is, is where do you find your identity you find your identity as a mom, a dad, a husband, and a wife. And those might all be true, but where's your real identity? And um, sometimes we've got to peel back some layers of the onion before we can really grasp and say, okay, yeah. I know what the Sunday school answer is when I ask you where you're at, who, where's your identity? But do you really know and live and trust who our identity is. I mean, you, if you're here today, uh, born again, I mean, you're special. You're, you're, part of, you're part of the Lord's China. Like, remember when your grandma had the China cabinet? You were, you're part of that China cabinet. He, 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 you're special to him. And uh, even if you're not saved here today, you're still special. You're still loved. He still wants to be able to put you in that china cabinet. Um, but listen, if you're not saved, you're not going in the china cabinet. Okay, your identity is different than mine. So, anyways, any birthdays? Happy birthday, Stan. Happy birthday, Stan. No, is there no other birthdays? Wow, that's unusual. How about how about um, anniversaries? Who's who's been married? Who's been married ten days? Who's been married fifty years? Anybody here married fifty years? Who you guys have been married fifty years? Fifty three years. That's a long time. Martha, you've been married for fifty three years. Fifty two years. <laughs> A blessed man. Who's been married like seven days? Ah, oh, okay. Six days. Six days. Congratulations. Well, we have no, well, we have lots of anniversaries. 53 years, that's nothing to sneeze at. 
you know I'm not even going to ask the next questions that I would like to ask on that but anyways let's uh, let's just go before the Lord in prayer and then we'll dismiss the kids and I got a, a message to preach this morning Father God we just thank you for your goodness thank you for creating us in your image which means Lord as you want us to laugh you want us to cry you want us to to just be okay sometimes and sometimes Lord you want us just to not be okay uh, we are created in in your image in your likeness and uh, I just praise you so much so much for that I thank you for these people who come here this morning uh, and as was prayed earlier I pray for those who couldn't be here pre- Especially I want to pray for our brother Paul, who's in LeGrand um, preaching this morning. And and uh, he just has a lot of expectations on himself, Lord. And and just just let him know in his heart of hearts that um, you're the one. You're the one doing this. So uh, just thank you for him. We thank you for Stan and Martha. We thank you for Vic, um, Vicky and James. And Mel and Larry, Lord, we just continually ask that you uh, keep that baby safe in in its mama's womb, and and we're just so excited, Lord, to uh, when it comes out as it grows, to just share your tender mercy and love with with them. And uh, Father, we do we do thank you for for Lucas by Candy and their and their family. Um, these things don't ever make any sense to me. And uh, I suppose that's why you didn't ask me. So I pray for for continued. Uh, well, I pray for mercy for for Lucas by Candy Lord, and I pray that you would heal his body. I go, well, how cool would it be if they put him in hospice and you show up, and uh, and then that ain't the case. So either way, Lord. We will, we pray for the family left behind that they can that they can grieve and mourn and rejoice healthily and uh, and just know that I believe Lucas knows who you are. He's going to a much much better place. We pray for Dan as he lost his his, his wife Sheila, and we pray for their kids and grandkids. We continue to lift up Riley and Tiffany and the boys to you and just ask that you would refresh them, renew them, continue to give them, especially Mama Tiffany. She she needs energy and uh, for, we just love that family so much, Lord. We just just put them in your tender care. We lift up Josh and his health problems and and now we lift up soon-to-be Grandpa Josh. And uh, we just ask for everybody involved in this would just take a breath. And as this little little child grows into a young adult, there will be plenty of times and reasons for us to be mad and upset. But right now is just not one of them. Right, right now we just want these two young people to know that having a baby the way they're doing it isn't an unpardonable sin. That this baby will be loved and cherished and and uh, and hopefully, as these two young people grow, and if the grandma's got anything to say about it, they will raise this baby up in the church to uh, know and love you. So uh, I'm excited. Anyways, Father, I let's thank you again for well for being you and loving people like us. I just pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, all right, all right. Kids. Rest of us, Ray, we're going to be in Romans chapter 14. Or not 14, 15, I'm sorry. Chapter 15. If you guys, you know what? I went to the eye doctor the other day because my glasses keep falling on my nose and I hate that. So I said, hey, will you tighten it up? So sure. So they tightened them all up and man, they fit, they fit great. They, they didn't fall. They didn't slip. 
but you couldn't close them. And last night, evidently, I thought they needed closed, and so now they're all bent and crooked, and yeah, there's just no happy medium at all. Who's that feller with you? Huh? I don't know. It's good to see you, buddy. You got, let me see, you got all your fingers? Got all your toes? All right. Well, that's probably just the numbness going from your, it was in your head at one time, and now it's just leaving and coming out your toes, dude. <laughs> well, welcome back. Oh, you're going to the East Coast. Man, don't they have enough people over there to fight their own fires? Huh. Well, it's job security for you, man. I guess. You know, I have picked on people who wore straps like that for so long, there's absolutely no way... <laughs> I would do that. It's a good idea, though. Thank you for the idea. <laughs> but uh, ain't happening. At least not when I'm in public. <laughs> hey, I want you to, you know what? Sometimes when we're getting ready to, to finish Romans here, you know, one of Paul's big things for the last few weeks is, is you know, we got to get along. I've always said, you know, the kind of, you have the Gospels, and they're telling you how to get saved. And then the rest of the Bible, other than Revelation, is just really trying to tell us how to get along, isn't it? I mean, let's get along with one another. Can we get along? And Paul, he's kind of been in, in 14 and now in 15, he's kind of given us uh, some, some encouragement on how to do that. So, anyway, I found this little little deal. I might have sent it to some of you this week. I just laughed. I had to share it. So, a little girl who was forced to eat alone at a small table in the kitchen um, as part of her discipline for disobeying. Uh, as her parents tr um, tried to ignore her, they heard her pray out loud. I thank thee, Lord, for preparing a table for me in the presence of mine enemies. <laughs> That's pretty funny, I thought. Huh? <clears throat> Bobby, you'll really appreciate this one. A little boy sitting on the front steps with his face cradled in his hands looked very upset. His father came home and asked him what was wrong. His sad son looked up and said, Well, just between us, Dad, I'm having trouble getting along with that wife of yours. <laughs> oh. Yeah, listen, I have some good news. And I have a little bit of bad news this morning. All right? The good news is, is like I said a minute ago, is that everybody who's a Christian, you know what? We're all going to heaven. The bad news is that we're all traveling together. <laughs> we're all going together. Here, here we're, all, we're all coming. You know? Uh, it's easy to get, you know, it's easy to get out of sort with people. It's easy to have you full of people. And uh, no matter how well-meaning they are, for me anyway, it's no matter how well-meaning, no matter how rude, I mean, I deal with all kinds. But sometimes, sometimes, and probably more times than I want or should let, it, uh, yeah, I have to do a 12-step program and, you know, I don't, I don't do it well. And, uh... You know, Pastor Phil's been telling me for years, well, Dallas, you just got to stop taking people off. It's just my nature. I mean, it's just what I seem to do, uh, is take people off. We're going to be in uh, Romans chapter 15. If you've got your Bibles, open up there with me. And, and we're going to look at, at verse 1. And I know you guys might think this is a huge rabbit trail. And it kind of is. But I think it's a rabbit trail that I need, need to go down. Um, in Romans chapter 15, in verse 1, he says, Now we who are strong, remember in verse 14, he, he had said, Hey, f for those who are weak, we needed to do some things, right? And now he's saying, Hey, those of you 
who are strong have an obligation to bear the weakness of those without strength and not to please ourselves. So my question that I've really struggled on, I've tripped over. As a matter of fact, I couldn't go any further until, I, until we discussed, okay, weak and strong. You, just, you tell me I'm not supposed to judge people, but Paul himself is saying, no, man, there are some who are weak. There's, and some who are strong. And the best thing that I can come up with, and, I, and I, I said this right before the masses started leaving. Not saying this is why people, you know, are hunting all the time or what. But I did make the comment that the big C church has kind of got a problem with immaturity. Uh, it wasn't received extremely well, you know. Maybe I should have waited to make that comment until today. Because isn't that really, but when you're strong, you're mature. When you're weak, you're immature. doesn't mean that you're useless. It doesn't mean, and, and, and I'm serious, I was, I was putting a, a, a message together and thinking, yeah, those immature people. And uh, so then somebody asked me, well, Dallas... If the, the, the contrast is this, Dallas, is that if uh, in our church do we have people who are spiritually more spiritually mature than others? And I answered, I answered honestly and said, yeah, man, almost all of my congregation is way more spiritually mature than I am. Okay? It's true. A healthy church, we have to have... A, we have to have a mulligan stew of people in their faith. So by no means in the whole wide world, even if by the time I'm done here today, you're saying, man, he just called me immature. Uh, don't take it like I'm dinging you, okay? Because I think the truth is, is that we're all a little bit immature. This, is a, this isn't a race that we're gonna that we're gonna stop f running. Listen, this is a race. I should say that we're not. We shouldn't stop running until we the last breath. To the last to 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 the minute you receive Jesus and the Holy Spirit comes and lives in you, to the day you die, we should be growing. We should be being able to honestly say to ourselves, to the Lord, other people notice. Man, you know what? He's a better Christian today than he was yesterday. His faith is clearly stronger today than yesterday. You can kind of get a little hung up on the word mature because mature, the way the world says it, and the maturity I'm talking about are two different Two different things. The concepts is kind of the same, but listen, I think that you can be uh, by, you know, Webster's or Cambridge. I got this definition from Cambridge. It says to become more developed mentally and emotionally and behave in a responsible way. I think you can be that and be a baby in Christ. Okay. I think that you can be, by all human standards, a, a full, well-balanced, intelligent human being who knows how to go with life and, and be spiritually blind. Okay, so they're two different things. This sort of maturity is different. And you know, and you got to be careful because I, sometimes people might think that I'm calling them, you know, calling them weak. I'm, 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 making, I'm, I'm really doing a ding at them, and sometimes I do. Because they need to be dinged. You know what I mean? Uh, but in general, no. Because I, th I think it's huge that we have a marker. I mean, I don't know. It, to pick, a, pick a year. Do you want to look back every year? Oh, that's legalistic. Well, fine. Then let's, let's go back five years. Where were you? What did you think? And how did you respond to life five years ago? Compared to how you're responding to life today. Okay, and I'm going to tell you. Well, there ain't no different. Well, 
You know, you might want to you might want to take pause here and ask why. Okay? Because listen, you ain't there yet. Okay. We're not there yet. I I want to talk today to you guys about maturity. Spiritual maturity. First thing I think we got to kind of do is figure out what is it. What is it? What is spiritual maturity? Um, you know, spiritual maturity is achieved through becoming more like Jesus Christ. So the little example that I just gave, I guess the, the, the right thing is, is that do I look more like Jesus today than I did five years ago? Do I look more like Jesus today? Um, some of us, you know, we're not sure. We need to check more often. You know, am I more like Jesus today than six months ago? A year ago? Whatever. And hopefully, hopefully the answer can be yes. Look, and after salvation, every Christian begins the process of spiritual growth with the intent to become spiritually mature. Not much different than when we have our baby. This little baby that's going to be brought up. When it's a baby, we're expecting it to be a baby. But when it's 17, 18, 19, 20 years old, we're expecting it to be 17, 18, 19, 20 years old. So this should be ours as, as, as children of the God Most High who've been filled with the Holy Spirit. We, we, should, be, we should be intending to be able to answer, absolutely, yes, I am a better Christian today, a better human being today, than I was a year ago. We should be able to say, yes, that's me. And this is why I can say yes. Not to toot my own horn, but I want you to know that if I can do it, so can you. Because it's the direction I want to go. I want to be better. And, and I think every Christian should want to be better. Should want to have a better relationship with the lover of their soul. You know, according to the Apostle Paul, it's an ongoing process that will never end in this life. Listen to what Philippians 3, 12-14 says. It says, speaking of, speaking of full knowledge of Christ, he tells his readers that he himself has not already obtained this, or he has not already obtained all this, or have already been made perfect. But I press on to take hold of, of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Like Paul, we have to press continually toward deeper knowledge of God in Christ Jesus. It's something that we have to intentionally and purposefully, continually do. We don't, you know, I, 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 I talk to these people who, who are Christians and I love them to pieces. But I said, well, how do you read the Bible? Oh yeah, I read it once. I'm not joking. I've told you guys this a few times. The very first men's retreat I went to, there was these guys, and there was a father and son bragging about being deacons of a church for, for 25 years. <laughs> and when it come time to open up the Bible, one morning I've opened up the Bible and I'm a reading because that's what, since I got saved, they told me I should do, so I try to do. And he, this older guy, man, I mean, he's in his 70s at the time, so he'd been doing this a long time. He comes up and he goes, oh man, I didn't even bring my Bible. He says, I guess I need to open that up a little bit more. I mean, you know, those are people running the church. Those are people running the program who don't even read the book. Listen, we got to continually press on. You can't read it one time and think you got it. You're not going to read the whole thing front to cover a hundred times and get it. But every time you read it, every time you, you commit, you're going to get a little more. And a little more. And a little more. And then what we find out about the Bible is it's, it is right for everything.
every season of our life. Whether you're a brand new mama or not, you know, whatever your season is, it's got something for you in it. To where in a year from now you can say, I'm doing it different than I did it yesterday. It's in there for all of us. But we got to keep going for it. One of the biggest dangers that we have is when we think we already got there. <laughs> and I have met several people like that. Elderly people, please don't take this the wrong way. But I can't tell you how many people who got gray hairs like yours who've walked through our doors and we say, ooh, man, we, we need some help. They go, oh, no, 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 I did my time. I did my duty. It, that should not be your heart. If you're here today and got gray hair and have done it for 20 years, that means you're probably just now getting good at it. Why would you quit? Okay? Um, we got to continually press on. Always. But Christian maturity requires a radical reordering of one's priorities. It is what breaks my heart is when I've talked to people who've been Christians for 25, 30, 40 years, and they're just now realizing this. It's heartbreaking. It is crushing our country. It's crushing our families, our homes. This should not be. The immaturity. Um... Christian maturity requires radical reordering of one's priorities, changing over from pleasing self to pleasing God, and learning to obey God. That word obey kind of gets in the way of some of us. You can't tell me what to do. I'm an American. Herf, herf, herf. Right? The key to maturity is consistency. Perseverance in doing those things we know will bring us closer to God. These practices are referred to um, in, okay, I didn't know how to say this. These practices refer to as the spiritual disciplines and include things such as Bible reading, which I will beat to death on you people forever because we need to be reading the book. You need to be praying. Okay, we need to be fellowshipping. We need to be serving. We need to understand stewardship. Those are the practices that spiritually mature Christians get. And you know what? That's how they got it. They read the book. They get to praying. All these other things fall into place. Um... No matter how hard we might work on those things, however, none of this is possible without the enabling of the Holy Spirit within us. Okay? Galatians 5.16 tells us that we're to walk by the Spirit. The Greek word, uh, and obviously I'm not a Greek guy, so somebody I'm taking somebody's word for this. And the Greek word used here for walk actually means to walk with a purpose in view. Later in the same chapter, Paul tells us again that we're to walk by the Spirit. Uh, here the word translated walk has the idea of taking things step by step, one step at a time. I think a spiritual maturity comes the same way as big, huge problems. I know a year or so ago I'm talking to a feller who's got a whole room full of problems. Well, how do we tackle these problems? We tackle them one bite at a time. Right? That's how you eat an elephant. That's the old thing. How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. You know, bloating ourselves. It doesn't, trying to eat it all up at once ain't going to get it. We do it one bite at a time. How do we get, how do we get through this, this, uh, how do we get to where we can feel that, yes, I'm doing better today than yesterday, is one step at a time. Okay, one step at a time. Some of the most people that I respect the most in the faith, who I think have a direct line to the Lord, listen, they're still doing this one step at a time. Bill Bright, on his deathbed said, one step 
at a time. He was still fighting it. He was still important to move forward because we don't really get there until we leave here. All right, where was I at? You know what it is? Learning to walk under the instructions of another, the Holy Spirit. Um, and being filled with the Spirit means we walk under the Spirit's control. As we submit more and more to the Spirit's control, we will also see an increase in the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. I have said for years, you cannot wake up today and say, Ooh, I'm going to have the Spirit of love. Don't work that way. Okay? These are, this is as the Holy Spirit's becoming alive in you. As you are by step by step, by trial and error, by, by continually going forward. That's what the Holy Spirit produces. Okay? It's produced in us. It's nothing that you go and say, oh, well today I just want to be kind. Well, great, you can be kind today, but... It, it, are you kind? <laughs> and if we do this step by step, we'll be able to answer, yes, I think I'm kind. I'm just naturally kind. Today, I don't have to put kindness on because it's already there. Not because of me, but because of who lives in me. Does that make sense? As we submit more and more to the Spirit's control, we will also see an increase of the fruit of the Spirit's in our lives, as you see in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. And we spent a whole year last year with your kids teaching them the fruits of the Spirit. Or, uh, no, we taught, yeah, we were taught them the armor of God. This year is the fruit of the Spirit. Thank you. Uh, this is the characteristics of, I'm there, man. They've been Bible versing me every Thursday. Uh, this is the characteristics of spiritual maturity. But listen, when we become Christians, we are given all we need. Hear me when I'm telling you. We are given all we need for spiritual maturity. Tell, Peter tells us that God's divine power has granted us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. And that's in 2 Peter 1.3. God alone is our is our is, God alone is our resource. Okay, growth comes from um, comes by grace through Him, but we are responsible to make the choice to obey Peter, or to obey uh, Peter again helps us to in an, in this area. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self control, and self control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love for if these qualities are not yours or if these qualities are yours and increasing they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ that's second Peter 5 1 through 8 being effective and fruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus is the essence of spiritual maturity I just wanted to throw out here, and then we'll get out of here. Fifteen more things. So, <laughs> Bobby, would you go make another pot of coffee? <laughs> I thought I would do. Again, if any of this points to you, just remember that if I'm pointing the finger at you, I got at least three pointing back. Not to mention those of you who are my real close friends. I've got all your fingers pointing at me too. Okay, but what I've done is I've put, I put ten things that would say, hey, this is what a spiritually immature person would look like. Okay, and, and you might be surprised. You might be surprised how we identify with them, you know. But one of them is, 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 uh, um, spiritually immature person are those whose happiness depends on what kind of day you're having. That's a spiritually immature person. Isn't that, isn't that crazy? Philippians 4.11 says, Not that I am speaking or being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. 
completely the opposite. If a person's happiness, worth, is found in, in people, places, and things, that's too bad. Number two was those who are very proud of who they are. And there is no change in it. Do you ever know people? Nope, I'm a self-made man. I've done, you know. And it it, it don't matter. Yeah, I know, but the Bible says that you're you're broken. Nope. Anyways, proud, pride. Pride is a killer. Number three is those who are constantly reminding people that you are not perfect. And until they walk in your shoes, they should not judge you. Come on. I just had a young person this week telling me how, as a dad, we ought to not be telling people, hey, if I was you, I'd be doing this. Because I, you ain't walked in my shoes. You don't know, you don't know what, we, what I'm thinking. You don't know this. And I'm just, whoa, 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 listen. I am twice your age, son. Okay? You do whatever in the heck you want. I'm just telling you, when I did the things the way you're doing it right now, this is what happened. Take it however you want. See, spiritually mature persons like, no, I've already made my mind up is what, what that whole conversation is about. I've made my mind up and this is the way I'm going. Well, then I can respect you if you'll be a man and say, hey, I made my mind up. This is the direction I'm going. Rather than giving me this weird thing, you know. I mean, you're taking up my oxygen, son. Get away. Uh, Number four is for those who blame most of their problems on something else or someone else. Anybody know people like that? Were any of you like that? That's the question I want you asking yourselves today. I know George's stuff. But man, George, I want you to know your stuff. You know, ask, is this how I am? Do I find myself in this spot? It's always somebody else's problem. You know, you guys have heard me say this for years. The devil never made me do nothing. Because I've usually beat him to doing it. If there is a dumb thing to do, the devil, he didn't make me do it, man. I I could think of that all on my own. It's like my grandson, uh, Meredith, and your boy. Get together. Listen, what one of them ain't thinking of, the other is. You know, and it is so fun to watch. See, I'm my way. I mean, they don't need us influencing nothing. They will... They will tear it all apart, and and I'm thoroughly convinced they will rebuild it again. But uh, listen, I usually beat the devil to the dumbness. It's nobody else's problem but mine. But I know a lot of people who, who think that life's woes are all on somebody else. Rather than saying, ooh, yeah, I should have maybe not done that. That's pretty hard for someone who's full of pride to say, isn't it? Ooh, maybe I'd not have done that. Because I'd done that, now I'm here. But you just say, well, if Bobby hadn't have made me, you know, if he hadn't have made me do it. I just talked to a guy yesterday, as a matter of fact, who, um, and, and him and his, his, he has an ex-wife, and he's trying to oppose some things on her. And when he found out that, he wasn't, that she wasn't going to comply, well, then he just started doing the same thing that he didn't want her to do. So I'm saying, so why would you do that? I mean, is it, in his exact words, well, if she's not going to comply, then why should I? Well, because it was your idea. You're the one who said this is what you wanted. Uh, snap out of it. You know, stop making life miserable for everybody. Listen, number five says those whose one week standing in front of the whole congregation and terrif- okay, those who one week are standing in front of the whole congregation and testifying how awesome God is, and days later living as if it never happened. That's an immature Christian. I think we could put in the category in here. We've had people who we know love the Lord will do something, and then they have to come up here and tell us all. Okay? Um, to me, because, you know, they want to pat on the back. They want to be recognized. And I, and, I, and I know they should be recognized. But people, listen, you don't want to be recognized by us. 
If you've accidentally done something great that needs to be patted on the back, listen, the Lord will pat you on the back more than you could ever, those are the pats you want. The Bible says that if you come looking for a pat on the back for me, I'll give you that pat on the back, but that might be the pat on the back you get. And you much want to, want to have the pat on the back for the Lord much more than the pat on the back for me. That's just fact. Those who are a church hopper, uh, this is what I thought well, this was interesting, is that, is that these people put these guys as immature Christians. So those, those, those who are a church hopper, because of their immaturity, they have to bounce from church to church, because sooner or later their true self is revealed, and the only solution is to start fresh where no one knows them and their past. That's, that's an immature Christian. That's a Christian who will never grow. You know, man... And I know that a lot of you have come from other churches. And I know a lot of you have come from churches that you were at for a lot of years. Okay? So please don't, you know, I'm, I'm just going to be me, man. I'm telling you. What, 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 what the book says is that, you know what, if, you, if we have problems, let's work them out. Okay? Let's work them out the way that the, that the Lord we say we love instructed us to work them out. Okay? Not only does it make us stronger, makes us better, but you know what? Those who are watching the church, it makes them a little less doubtful. It might even bring them a little hope. I know that if we have problems in the church, man, it's so easy to say, fine, I'll go somewhere else. I am so thankful that, that, that the core of San Hollow Baptist Church didn't do that core group here people and you all know who you are and we have fought this thing out to God's glory in my opinion okay um, and we're all better for it and our community's better for it our homes are better for it right okay number seven those who refuse to change until someone else changes or the circumstance changed already talked about them immature every trial and hardship knocks them further from God instead of building uh, perseverance trust and faith in God you know that's that's my heart that's my heartache with a lot of this ooh, uh, the movement of the spirit and you need to feel this and feel that I mean I, I just get very weary of that because when those people seem when that gets rocked a little bit okay so does their their faith gets rocked a little bit man no way I want you people to do what I want you people to do what I've done I have built my steps in this ladder like this wide because I'm gonna fall I'm gonna trip okay but if I make my steps narrow shoot I could fall all the way to the bottom of this deal couldn't I but I'm making my steps on this ladder and this stairway big. So when I fall, I'm not going all the way to the bottom. I'm probably not even going to break my leg or my arm. <laughs> okay? That's what people who are mature do. I'm not saying that I'm mature. I just got done telling you that I'm not. But the people who, who, who let every little hiccup make them question God... Make this, make that. Uh, come on. Come on. Now, those who are always choosing sides when your life is a roller coaster of drama, strife, and jealousy. Okay? That's why a lot of you might be here from another place. Is this very reason? It's immaturity. Okay? I'm not saying you guys aren't, but I know that we have a lot of churches that are. The immature um, that say their immaturity usually, this, this, here's, this is a fact. Um, I don't even, can't, I'm not even going to try to pronounce this guy's name. But he says the immature that stay in their immaturity usually never finish the race. That means that they're Listen, I know a gentleman, Joel and I were just talking about him with, uh, with some other friends, Richard Cook. Remember Richard Cook? That's who I was supposed to be praying for today. Listen, who, who planted churches for 30 years. And he come to Idaho, he planted a church, it didn't, didn't go. Come to find none of his churches went. Well, 
Suddenly, after 30 years, the, the powers to be are saying, dude, okay, we've been paying your bills now for 30 years, and we're really not seeing any fruit from this. So they let him go. He don't even go to church anymore. He doesn't go to any church anymore. They want nothing to do with the church because the church hurt us. That's immaturity. You know, that's immaturity. He never finished the race. And when you look at his career and his life, he's, he's always been... This worries me about me. There ain't one thing on here that I read to you people that I couldn't, don't, or haven't struggled with. Okay? This is, this is who people are. That's why it's so important, so important, that we don't stop reading the book. Okay? That you don't stop praying. You don't stop gathering. We continue to run the race like we want to win it. And then I think we'll get there. Again, I'm really glad that we're not like all those other churches. And we've got a bunch of pretty spiritually mature people here. And you know what? If you're thinking about this and you're hearing this and, and you think, ooh, man, I need some help. Listen, that's what we're all here to do. That's what we're here to do is help. I need you to grow grow. You need me to grow. Let's come together over the only thing that I believe that will, will, will make that happen. And that's what that book opened. Have our nose in the book. You know, we're learning on Sunday that we need to, that we need to read the text. We need to interpret the text. And the hard part is, for most of us, is to apply what we've read. If we can continually do that and not lose sight of that, We're there. We're fine. We're moving in the right direction. There isn't one of you in this room who wouldn't be able to tell me next year, six months, whenever. No, I know I have a better relationship with the Lord today than I did six months ago. I know that I am becoming more and more like Jesus today than than I ever have in my life. It's possible. Only possible, I mean, you know what? This rich relationship with God that I desperately want every one of you to experience, it's obtainable. It's obtainable. Carl and Bob, you guys can you guys can finish this race strong. How cool would that be to finish the race well? Even you, George. Bow your heads with me, please. Father God, I thank you. Thank you for being a good God. Thank you for getting us on on this program, for lack of better words, that you've instructed us how to live our lives. And Lord, if we continually read the instruction book and, and adjust a few things, you show up and do most of it. You're the, you're the one who shapes and molds us. We just have to let you. So, Father, I, I, I thank you for the strong Christians that you've brought to San Hollow Baptist Church. And I know because of the, their uh, faith in you and their maturity in you that, that they do uh, fill the gap for their weaker um, brother or sister. Because we know that that weaker brother or sister one day will get it. And they'll be, be filling the hole for somebody else. And then it just keeps going. And thank you for... I just thank you for not saying, man, this is the deal. And if you don't do it, you're out of here. That's not you. There's so much room for grace. So much room for growth. Father, I'm going to close this prayer with asking this, that you would give every soul in this building today an unquenchable thirst to sit down and be in your word this week. Even if it's for five seconds, 
Father, I pray that everybody here in, here in this building today would take time to be on their hands and knees of their heart and, 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 and lift up your name and praise you. I hope I, my prayer is, Lord, is that we will be intentional with this as we uh, are on the journey to become just like Jesus. I love you, Lord. I love these people. And we pray these things in your beautiful son's name, Jesus. Amen.